Hi, everybody. We're the Skeleton Crew, and today we are going to be talking to you about a little sauropod called Niger Saurus. Um, before we get into today's video, I want to thank everybody for turning out to our charity live streams, because by my math, this video will come out after we've done the live stream that we're going to do in a few days. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. You know, whatever amount of money we raised, which, which will be, will be on, now screen on screen now. Now. That Sponge amount of ball. money Look at that. is extremely generous and really helps to support a good cause. We thank all of you for turning up and being so uh, kind and giving and doing what you can to keep the next generation of paleontology moving forward. So Indeed. we really appreciate all of that. Amelia does too, even though she didn't want to show that by being present for today's recording. She's at the zoo right now. <laughs> she's having a good time. Yeah, she's having a great time at the Bronx Zoo. We would not take that from her. Um, no. It's also a much better time for your favorite skeleton crew members here, th those being all of us except Alex, in that SVP is over. And and therefore, we can kind of commit more of our brain power to these videos than we have been for the last couple of weeks. Because I will tell you, I've been on a different planet entirely. Yes. I see Alex's silence. It, yes. Mm -hmm. We went from, at least for Dalton and I, we were in the field oh and then God. to SVP. And then... uh. There was another little conference after SVP. Big, big few weeks for your favorite uh, skeleton boy. Yes, indeed. Uh, really, really, really big few weeks. Two conferences, two talks for me. Um, and a lot of really, really wonderful opportunities to talk about our research with our colleagues. I would say that we got some really good feedback, especially for some fun time. projects Alex and I are working on. Yes. Everyone thinks we're cool and smart. Not everyone. <laughs> a lot of people think we're cool and smart. A lot of people, people think, we're matter, cool smart. think we're cool and smart. Yeah. Anyway, we should probably talk about Niger Source. But before we do that, I should probably inform you who I am. I am not Niger Source. But I am Dr. James Napoli, a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. My name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Cool. <laughs> I'm Alex Rubenstahl, and while I'm not Nijiosaurus, I do feel a incredible overwhelming hunger, much like it must have felt every moment of its life. <laughs> I'm so hungry. You ordered food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's too late now. <laughs> I am Nijersaurus. <laughs> no, I'm Dalton Meyer. Yeah, I'm a PhD yeah. candidate at Yale University. And together, and together we're, the we are we're the skeleton crew. Most of it. Most it's of it. Familia. Yeah, most of it. I'm well, speaking of Nijersaurus, despite us having one on stream right now talking to us, Dalton, do you want to release him so we can take a look-see? I would love to. I'd love Let's nothing more. Into the... Whoa, Dalton, hold on. Have you created a braided stream channel? Oh, I sure have. Not only have I created this, I created it a long time ago for another video. Oh, uh, yes. With a dinosaur that may appear in this episode? It at will. At some point? Mm, probably. They're already there. Oh! Suckomimus is already there. It is. Oh my god. Look at these, look at these babies. Now, now, despite us making many jokes at the expense of Suckomimus and its name, this is an incredibly vacuum-shaped animal. So this would be the true Suckomimus? This it would is. be. This is a vacuum <laughs> mimic. <laughs> well, first they have to climb the, uh, oh, look at, oh, I the love hill it. of trepidation. Dude, the pit, they're, they're, they're really working very hard there. <laughs> no, I love yes. how it looks like there's a hell of a lot of effort going into that. I do like Our, that the animation really shows how small this animal's brain was. Like, it looks like walking is really <laughs> hard for it. It's thinking I, about every step a lot. He, this he's, is like when you have a little kid who's learning to write their name, and like every letter takes about five years to write. Just yep. like a. <laughs> this crap. Now. We're, now, what are you doing with your? Oh, that's me writing, writing an a. Slow. 
Yes, that's what its walking looks like. I <laughs> see. That's a anyway. Very good continue joke, with exactly. whatever. I was just gonna say, you know, we have a few things to say about this animal. Um, we but do. the first thing we can say about it is, what does its name mean? Well, that's a great question. Well, it means... was there just it... a siren in someone's background, or am I? Losing no, that's mind? that's what nature source yeah, sounds like sound in this game. Never mind. <laughs> What does its name mean? <laughs> um, it means the Saurus of Nature. Lizard from. Yeah. <laughs> it means uh, Nature Saurus. <laughs> <laughs> nature Saurus is derived from the Latin Nature Saurus, meaning Nature Saurus. Um, I mean, essentially, right? Basically. Uh, but it's, but, but, as Dalton said, the Saurus from Niger. Um, the Lizard from Niger. Uh, and its yeah. species epithet, uh, Tiketti, is oh. n- named for uh, Philippe Tiquette, who was the man who originally, uh, who was the paleontologist, rather, not just a man, but a paleontologist, who uh, originally discovered the, re- uh, the first remains cool. back in the mid-70s, like 76. This dinosaur was known for a very long time before it was actually formally named by Serena et al. in uh, 99. Hmm. Yeah, well, I always find it interesting when that kind of thing happens. Actually, you know sorry, I, mean? I underestimated. It was originally first uh, the first material thought to belong to Nijersaurus was discovered back in, this, in 65. Oh, wow. By the French? Yeah, well, Philippe so, Tequet is French. That's amazing. I would not have guessed. <laughs> it all makes sense now. Oh my god, look at his tongue sticking out when he drinks. Oh, oh my god, god. Oh. I hate that a lot. I've you never know seen what? that like, before. I, I would have imagined that... I, I know it's wrong, but l- the fact that its face just looks like you took one of those like Fallout character creation sliders and just went all the way to one of the sides, <laughs> I expected its tongue to be wide and square as well. <laughs> this is like the monster factory of dinosaurs, right? It really that is. is. Uh, I like that the two animals uh, known from this geological formation have been stretched in the opposite direction. <laughs> wide or long. <laughs> Inside you, there are two wolves. One is wide, one is long. <laughs> okay, I mean, by, that, the the by that logic, we're going to find a tall dinosaur. We, I well, maybe we they'll do. find Spinosaurus. In that formation. <laughs> Maybe. Well, hang on. Cool. We do have cool. Oranosaurus. <laughs> we do have a tall. It all works, all works out. It's, every axis has been stretched in this formation. Like, that's a nature paper right there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Ax- yeah, it's about as... It, no, wait, I can't. No. Uh, what if it's just video. like geological distortion? Like... What if the rock got stretched in one direction and Tsukamimus' skull was laying in the direction of stretch? It's, preserved. it's just a normal fuck. It's like just a normal megalosaur. Yeah, it's just a normal dinosaur. This is, a, this this a, normal is a normal rebeccasaurid, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Perpendicular to they're, direction. They're, they're in like the thrust and fold regions of, of some like mildly metamorphosed stone. And right. one's in the stretch zone up top and one's in the squish zone in front. That's great. That's, we've figured that's it my out. nature paper. Yeah, we've solved it. These so were two geology geology didn't even know existed. Right. I technically have a geology degree. That, that, that. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Technically. Me too. We all have uh, geology well, degrees. Well, did you know they just give anyone a geology degree? Yeah, I know. I got one. <laughs> hey, you worked hard for that, Scott. I did. <laughs> like, really hard. <laughs> um, got for a degree in geology? Mm-hmm. Hey, <laughs> it, it, getting a degree is a whole lot harder when you can't read. Um, I, I that's bet. true. Yeah. What I was but, um, what I was going to postulate about is just that with Nijersaurus being known and not named for so long, like that happens to a lot of stuff. Like I can think of several things in the modern literature that are just referred to as like the blank taxon or like the blank member of this group. Like that yeah. we know oh, it's yeah. a new thing I mean, and it hasn't received like- a name. I wonder if this was treated that way or if people just kind of didn't really think and know about it. It was. Yeah. Um, for a while, it was it was mentioned that uh, there were uh, relatively common 
like indeterminate sauropod or possibly uh, dicreosaurid material mm-hmm. that was found in the Elraz. And it wasn't until like much better material was found later that it was actually determined to one, not be a dicreosaurid, which is a critter, th- which is a group of sauropods that we've talked about previously on here. Uh, they're, and I could see why someone would think that this is a dicreosaurid. Yeah. Um, audience, the dicreosaurids are uh, the group of very, very famously short-necked sauropods. Things like Amargosaurus, um, Bajatosaurus, uh, Brachytrachylopan, things like that. Um, Dicreosaurus. Dicreosaurus itself. Um, And this guy being a very small and really short-necked and Mm weird-headed sauropod, I... That would have been my first guess as to what this was as well. But turns out it's not. Um, Alex, and, what is this thing? Well, I, before I tell you what this thing is, because I will tell you these things, this knowledge will be made <laughs> available. But just on something Dalton said that I think is worth noting, a lot of time, a lot of times, material is collected and it sits somewhere and no one describes it for a little while. And this is something that, you know, Dalton, uh, Dalton has experienced. He's describing some squams that were languished for a long time in the collection and James and I both uh, named a dromaeosaur that was uh, just it was chilling on a shelf for you know a few decades so this is this is not an uncommon occurrence you know in right. our field of paleontology uh, in fact actually, it's a very common occurrence yeah I, I think it's rare for you know unless truly something stupendous where you find it you try to get the description out as quick as you can but even in that case uh because uh, Niger source is relatively stupendous in a few of its features, it still can take some time. Yeah, anyway, let's talk about um, sauropods. A sauropod is to? a kind of... Yes, okay. there are like nine in this game. We, we don't talk about them that much. Um, so sauropods are a group of saurician dinosaurs. That means their hip goes that way. They have their pubis points towards their head, anteriorly. Um, we've talked about a few sauropods uh, in this game so far. Uh, specifically, our so, friend here belongs to the diplodocoid uh, side of the tree. These are like, things like Apatosaurus, Plodocus, um, and Amargosaurus. Actually, this is the last one of the group we haven't talked about in this game, so that's kind of cool. Hmm. Uh, then it belongs to the Rebacosaurus. Rebacosaurus? Rebacosaurus? I've, I've always, always heard of Rebeccasaurids. Rebecca 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 yeah, Rebecca that's fine. Like, I don't, like Becky. Rebeccasaurids, uh, which in, I think, almost all phylogenies of uh, sauropods, of neosauropods, and of diplodocoids in particular, are the earliest diverging group. Hmm. Um, so if you were to, if, if this V I am making with my hand are, you know, dicreosaurs, and then Apatosaurus and Plodocus, Rubacosaurus are even, they're even farther down the tree. Um, and they are known from a few places in the world. Uh, so obviously they're known from Africa, but they're also known from North America. And I think they're also known from South America now too. Um, and we'll discuss a little more uh, about, about these neat, the distribution of this clade. But in general, they have relatively shorter necks although I'm not sure how much of their understanding uh, is based really solely off uh, Nidrosaurus. Because it's one of the better known ones, I think. Yeah, it is one of the better known ones. And it's also mm-hmm. well, very much one of the weirder ones. But mm-hmm. there are there are some it, other well-known ones. Is it the only skull we have for the group, for the clade? Or are there skulls from the other ones? I don't know. Because that'd be interesting, right? Is the is like is is its iconic shovel face a feature of the group, or is it just a feature of this strange critter? We have a skull from Lavocatisaurus. Okay. Um, what does it look? Like? Which is from Argentina. It looks diplodocusy ish. Okay, so this yeah. might ish. be a, a unique. Uh, actually emphasis on the ish it kind of has a little bit of a square nose too at least in that okay. i think oh hmm. i think you know just in terms of in terms of phylogeny because we'll bring it back to a term uh, a little term invented by mark morell there is um the sorry to lineage. interrupt this oh that's fine go ahead is that um there is a, a jaw there's a dentary known from demondosaurus which is from spain 
Um, mm-hmm. And it seems to oh, be so kind of normal. Too. Yeah, it seems it doesn't oh. seem to be as um, flat. But it is, right. it is so fragmentary. Our friend here is a little weird. But yes, so I mean, this is a, this is an early Cretaceous animal. It's the it's the earliest diverging member, uh, er, the earliest diverging group of diplodocoids. Uh, but it is worth pointing out that there are some from the late Jurassic, so that ghost lineage, because we would expect this split somewhere in the middle Jurassic, probably. It, isn't it? Isn't it interesting where that seems to be where a lot of groups split, and we have no fossils? <laughs> Um, but yeah, Weird. so this there there is this is not an appalling uh, ghost lineage that sometimes other early members of clades are found to have. I think, for example, like house garaptorines are often found to be very early diverging dromaeosaurs, but we're missing all of that record. At least like this is a case where almost a hundred million years. Yeah, don't worry about that. This is a case where right. we do have the weird stuff in the Cretaceous, but there are also Jurassic fossils, um, which must be there. So. Right. That is, I don't know what any of the characters for this group is, so I'm going to stop talking. I'm sorry, 100 million year ghost lineage. I just want to put that in perspective for our audience. <laughs> that is, the divergence happened when Deinonychus was alive. And the first one you see is right now. Yes. That's what? That's two Eocenes ago. That's two thirds of the entire reign of the dinosaurs. Yes. Whales had time to inv- whales had time to evolve twice. Yeah. Wow. Yes. If whales were so good, where's whale two? Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, stupid joke. Years. Why the f- did I say that? <laughs> I don't know. I love that. that. Scott. The, 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 if if X is so good, why are they dead? Is one of my favorite jokes. It is also yeah. worth pointing out, I guess, just in terms of discussing these lineages that uh, diplodocoids do go extinct uh, before, or at least appear to go extinct before the big rock um, and this mm-hmm. would have represented one of the la- like kind of the, the tail end of their diversity which seems to have reached maybe into the middle Cretaceous and then like that's you know to I think to quote Dennis Nedry, the Titanosaurs were dancing extinct. still they say they'll live forever but Nijersaurus won't um, I just want to say one thing because Alex mentioned not knowing the features of the group yes and the main features that diagnose Rebachysaurs, it, it seems to me that the monophyly of the group is a little bit weak. Okay. Based I'm, on... I'm now looking at literature on the other screen that is blowing out all yeah, of, wow. like, my retinas completely. I, I am... <laughs> the light of truth. <laughs> the light of the truth of the weakly supported monophyly of Rebachysaurids. Um... I am the, the main thing the is that di- diplodocoids um, generally have bifid cervical neural spines. Mm-hmm. But these don't. But that's a derived feature of like in a subgroup or rather a less inclusive group within diplodocoids. So oh, that is a- not it, that is not a synapomorphy of rebachysaurs. It's a right. simply of all of right. the uh, oh, okay. of all of the sauropods. Right. Huh. So, so you can't define a group based on the presence of an ancestral trait. You have to define a group based on the presence of a new trait. Right. A plesiomorphy like this, a trait inherited from common ancestors, does not diagnose you as being part of a group. This is called how cladistics works. We're de- we're definitely going to make a video about this. <laughs> we will. We promise. But, but, oh as a good example, we can always do that. Hair in mammals versus having five fingers on your mammoths and mammals. Right. Hair is a feature that unites mammals, and that is a synapomorphic, and provides grouping information. Whereas having, you know, usually having five digits on your hand, which is something that is shared widely across mammals, uh, is a plesiomorphic. Ple- uh, my words got tangled up. It's plesiomorphic uh, because... That's the ancestral condition of all crown amniotes. And so if you go outside that, you'll find that widely sampled throughout. That being right. said, it is a relative term. And depending on where you're sampling, uh, what was a synapomorphy can become a plesiomorphy and vice versa. Right. Another way to say this, I think, is that, you know, every trait, there, there's a level of the tree of life at which every trait is informative. But yeah. once you are past that level you don't use it anymore for grouping information. So like what Alex is saying is that, you know, there was a point where the five fingered hand evolved, 
But once that evolved, it's no longer useful to use the presence of a five-fingered hand as your grouping criteria. Right? You have to use other traits after that to figure out how closely related things are. In any case, there is a snap amorphy for Rubacosaurids, which have um, lo- their teeth have low angle internal wear facets and asymmetrically mm-hmm. distributed enamel. Interesting. That seems like something that could only be known for very few of them, though, for which there are teeth. It, it does seem that way, and it seems that in general, I, that trait seems like something that could evolve multiple times. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I would not be incredibly surprised if new fossil evidence shows that Rubacosaurids are not a, a natural group, given that there's very limited information that actually unites them as a group. But that's the way that sure. phylogenetics works. You know, new fossil evidence and the inclusion of new species can change what we perceive groups to be. And that's not a bug in the system. That's actually a it's feature. A feature. Right. New fossil. Who dis? And it should be worth... Well, we don't want to get into a philosophy of phylogenies here, but... Adding new tax is very good. Do it. Right. In fact, the most important thing you can do is add more tax to your analyses. Yes, you need to also have enough characters to act- adequately describe the tax in your tree. But generally, what's observed in simulated studies is that if you are if you have a matrix that's already big enough, adding more species generally improves the accuracy of the tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> faster than adding new taxa, or I'm sorry, faster than adding new characters improves the accuracy of a tree when you are keeping the number of species set the same. Yeah, and there's something to be said for, like, incomplete fossils, right? Because sometimes adding incomplete material, uh, incomplete species could make your results worse, and often they do. <laughs> right. This is a, this is, it's, it's a general thing, it's not like, you know, You play it by ear. Anyway. Anyway, so what what's going on with the semicircular canals in this guy's head? <laughs> Why is he looking at the ground? Someone make that... the home improvement noise. Oh. <laughs> I, I know that that's at least the first thing that I think about when I see this thing's head is what's going on with the semicircular canals, not right, anything else ass. about its head. What is a semicircular canal? Let's start with that. It's a yeah. canal that's not a complete circle. There we Scott, go. Scott with the with the flippant answers. Scott. <laughs> um so in in your ear, you have a structure in your ear called the inner ear. Mm-hmm. And Whoa. the Whoa. Slow down, hold on, what's up? <laughs> what? Are you telling me that the inner ear is in my ear? It's in your ear, the inner ear. It's in your ear. Um Inner ear in my ear? It's more, more likely, likely than, than you think. think. Wait, are you guys not I like a thin layer you. of like living plasma wrapped around pure energy? You have stuff inside you. <laughs> we do. Wow, that's, that's um, weird. So this structure called the inner ear is very complex, and there's a couple of things that happen there. You have a cochlea or some homolog of it that receives sound wave signals from the outer ear and looks the middle like a snail. ear. Right. Well, in mammals, it looks like a snail. <laughs> it, it's the snail that lives in my ear and tells me to buy myself a little treat when I'm having a bad day. Yeah, I- exactly. Um, yeah. So you've got your cochlea, or, or legana is often what it's called in non-mammalian vertebrates. Um, they're homologous, the same thing. The cochlea is the spiraled version of the structure. Because mammal ears um, are weird. Mammal ears are very weird. So that's what's receiving sound signals. And then you have um, the sacculus and the utriculus and the semicircular canals, which are these, what? What? Sacculus? No, sacculus. <laughs> be adults. No. All of you be adults. <laughs> oh, I was trying to say sacculus so fast. Just let's blow past this so that we don't have a stunt lock about the word sacculus, and we should just move on to the utriculus. Oh yeah, that's so much better than the sacculus. I, well, I was actually, I was laughing at the utricula. <sighs> right. The you have these organs. They're filled with otolith. Because something, sometimes, you know, you can trickle out of your sack. <laughs> oh, so like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, All right. We're cool. Anyway. We're good. 
you've got semicircular canals and there's fluid inside the semicircular canals. And the motion of that fluid tells you uh, the orientation of your head. And that's really important for maintaining balance. And there's actually an interesting story here because I believe hagfish only have one semicircular canal. I have no idea. Yeah. I, I believe. I know it increases as you get up through like yeah. lampreys and stuff. I know, when you I know lampreys up. have two. Okay, so that makes that would make sense right. why they have. Right, so I think I think hagfish only have one. So if you only have one semicircular canal, basically if you have a canal in this plane, you can tell rotation in that plane. Mm-hmm. So if you have Ginger only right. one I'm right that there's only one hagfish. Yeah. So the hagfish can only know its balance in one axis of rotation. I think it's roll. I think they understand if they're upside down or not. Because they tie hmm. themselves. I do. I think that's the case. Um, now lamprey have two, so they can tell. I believe roll and pitch, but not yaw. And then more derived fish, including us. Yeah, I think nathostomes. Yeah, nathostomes. Have three, but it might be like in uh, Ephelaspis too, if I remember. I, I don't know the exact note it appears at, but in, among the crown groups by nathostomes, you have all three semicircular canals, which means you can do, if you are if you were a fish facing the camera right now, but you, my hand is the fish, to be clear. You can do roll, you can do pitch, and you can do yaw. Those are the three directions of rotation, right? Well, so, I mean, you could do those as a hagfish. You would just be very confused. Well, well I, that's what I mean, rather. When I say you can do them, it's not that you can make that motion. It's that you understand that you have moved if you rotate in those axes. Yeah. Right? And now, you can and sense I mean, it, yeah. There are people for which, like, a semicircular canal winds up being pathological, and they lose sensation in one of those ways, and they, like, won't necessarily know if their head has tilted in one direction or not because they can't balance it's rare for that to happen in both ears, so there's always, mm -hmm. like, a failsafe. And some people have bad balance, and some people have good balance, and a large part of that is how sensitive your semicircular canals are to those rotational differences. Um, um, why do I bring up I'm... semicircular canals, you may ask? Well, hold on. Okay, Alex. Yes, go ahead. Because, I mean, how the semicircular canal... No, never mind, I'm thinking lateral lines. Ignore me. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess um, the similar principle, right? Like fluid action over these tiny little sensory cilia that like triggles the triggles. Jesus Christ. Yes, <laughs> it, triggers. it triggles your senses. Oh, uh, yeah, let's little. move on. Let's talk about the yeah. head position. So uh, what I want to say is while Alex is trying to bring up a remarkably complicated system of like, you know, sensory information and nerve transduction. The I used way to you know can... the name of those cilia too. Yeah, I did too. The way you can imagine it is like, you know, the little bubble in a level it's if you rotate it, the bubble position moves. So it can tell you where level is. And then any degree of uh, deviation from level will be indicated by the bubble moving progressively in one direction. That it is not literally how this works, but that is kind of figuratively what's going on inside the mm -hmm. semicircular canal. It's that the fluid moves and the amount and direction that the fluid moves tells you how much your head is rotated. So, that's why you get dizzy. That's why you get dizzy. You right. spin really yes. fast. Um, slosh that stuff around. Yeah, you yeah, don't want it sloshing, sloshing around. Yeah. Confuses the, the also stale. why alcohol uh, makes you dizzy. Is it really? If you, over, if you overindulge, yeah. It, um, well, like, it modifies the viscosity of the fluid temporarily. Am I remembering that correctly? Huh. I, 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 I thought it was a... Let me I, see. I'm, I thought it was that it inhibited the, the like sense of those organs slightly. Like It just muddied it a bit. No, it's it's um, according to, to Google very quickly, it is uh, alcohol thins the blood, which creates a difference in the density between the fluids in the canal and okay. the copula. Um, wow. Hmm. And so your brain it isn't like ready to compensate for that. That's I guess, interesting. I guess you really only start feeling very dizzy if you've had quite a bit to drink. So like, I, I guess at that point you are changing your blood. Oh, yeah. Why did I bring this up? Why did I bring yeah. up the semicircular canals? Well, there was a study in 2007, I believe, mm -hmm. that indicated that the orientation of the semicircular canals in these animals was indicative of the head posture being a habitual downward tilt. 
because the horizontal canal was assumed to correlate with the uh, normal, like, neutral plane for head posture, being mm -hmm. that the animal at rest would hold its head in a way that the horizontal semicircular canal was level with the ground. And yes. in these animals, the brain case is quite twisted. Like, it's kind of, relative to the skull, you could kind of imagine it that the snout is here, and the brain case has rotated down. Right, the, the occipital condyle is kind of ventral. And because of that, mm -hmm. to reorient things so that the horizontal semicircular canal is level, you need to reorient the head so that the snout is kind of facing straight down. Mm -hmm. um, like it's shown here. No, kind of, if, if not actually more extreme, like like almost 90 degrees. Yeah, I think it might be worth noting that uh, the, the interest in the angle of the head, at least in sauropods, is not just limited to our good friend, who I can hear wailing. Uh, but it is also related to a kind of older debate and discussion on um, position of the neck. Mm -hmm. so I, I, yes. Interest beyond this. Sorry, you were just. I've sure also heard it uh, get brought up in other animals as well. Just the idea of the horizontal one is essentially like a, a, a tr uh, like a neutral posture like i've heard it brought up in some pterosaurs that they have that they might have had a natural resting position of the head of slightly downward turn so like eyes were looking over the beak and stuff like that mm -hmm. i bring up this whole semicircular canal thing because there's this thing that happens in science um called people are wrong sometimes <laughs> and, and sometimes there are ideas. frequently in paleontology it, it is it is a frequent thing that happens in our field um, sometimes you come up with an idea that seems to be incredibly reasonable and like it would just be a natural thing. Like, yeah, we would expect that the semicircular canals would indicate the neutral head posture pretty well. They don't. Um, studies that have tried to validate this in the years since it was proposed for Nigerosaurus have found that it's actually more of a correlation with diet than any sort of habitual head posture. Uh, and that animals do not have a resting or neutral position that correlates with the horizontal plane of the semicircular canals. The idea was a good one. It was come up with by very smart people. Um, it was tested and it was disproven. That's how science works. Uh, with that said, I don't think that there is any reason to think that Nijersaurus had a particularly downturned um, normal head position. I think it's possible, though, and the orientation of the occipital condyle does kind of mandate that it's something more like this. Like, it wasn't going to be a normal sauropod head. Mm-hmm. But the idea it, that you have to get it into this position where it's basically at a 90 degree angle to the ground, I don't think that's required. If anything, it probably would have had this head posture a lot of the time, but mostly just because that's how it was eating, because that's where the teeth are and that's where its food is. Yes, right. We, we brought up, and I, I was going to say that um, another one of the reasons why people were interested in the like neutral head posture of uh, Nijersaurus and trying to figure it out is because of its uh, fairly unique dentition um, which is probably Goofy. what we talk about next and I'll try and find one that is opening its mouth and do my classic uh, terrible camera. You know what's something we don't talk about a lot? What's that? And, and don't be mad at me and don't hate me and don't make fun of me because okay. I can't take it but uh what, what, what do we? What do we think the deal of like, like lips and cheeks and sauropods is? Hmm. That was a, that was quite an inhale. Yeah, because it's it's one of the things that's a little bit. I, I wouldn't even necessarily say bad on this model, but I, I think it's just interesting. Is that? Oh God, does it not have separate teeth? Are they just plates? They're, they're kind of oh. like got lines. Okay, um, they have lines, which, okay. I mean, but also right, no. fine, yeah. But, sure, good enough. Um, like, on this model, like, if you were to put a Nijersaurus skull or, like, another reconstruction of Nijersaurus next to it, this this head has a lot of soft tissue on it. Mm -hmm. um, they did really give it cheeks, which I'm pretty, I'm, I'm a proponent for cheeks on a lot of plant-eating dinosaurs, but most of those I'm a proponent for them because they could chew. Uh, this guy couldn't, um, which we'll get to. But yeah, like I know that um, 
the jagged fang um Nijersaurus, uh has a lot a, a lot slimmer head um and i like it really is like we don't know the extent of soft tissue on a lot of these things although uh it is very very often brought up that there might be a keratinous sheath on as we've talked about like briefly on some other sauropod dinosaurs but especially on Nijersaurus, uh like that kind of would have been beak-esque at the end of this thing's face because it wasn't weird enough already um, right, it has to get weirder it has to get weirder but yeah to in a long and rambling and uncommittal way of answering your question there alex I like that smiling at me. Is that a smile? Yeah. I like to think of it as a smile. It, it's it's like the uh, the grimace emoji where it's just Yeah, I so. do think that there's a possibility for extra oral coverings in these animals. Mm-hmm. I would guess lips. Mm-hmm. In some of them. What about cheeks are probably trunk. unlikely. Uh probably no trunk. Not a trunk. <laughs> We're bringing sauropod trunks back. Many people are saying that they're coming back. Many people. Many people, have been saying many that. people are saying this. Well, many people are also talking about is how many weird teeth this guy has. How many teeth does it have? A lot. Lots. I don't. So, I want to know exactly how many though. How many oh, have. let me find out. It's like over six hundred or something, right? No. Well, it's how many? How many are in occlusal versus how many does it have? like total in its head because so Nijersaurus here is Mm -hmm. another dinosaur that has a dental battery. As you may remember from our episodes on uh, a lower Titan. And I believe we also talk about it in um, Mudaburosaurus. A lot of these Ornithischian dinosaurs have dental batteries that make them incredibly efficient chewers. They have, especially in the more advanced hadrosaurs, what we like to call sometimes uh, super teeth, where they're like a big, crazy grinding surface that's made up of hundreds upon hundreds of teeth that are all growing together and Mm -hmm. coming up to this grinding surface in concert. And along with their mobile skulls and everything are making them very, very, very efficient at grinding down plant material. Nijersaurus has dental batteries as well on the top and bottom jaws, but all of its teeth are in the front. It doesn't have any grinding teeth. And these dental batteries were crazy um yeah i mean and i think we've talked in past videos about how strange like diplodocus teeth are in terms of their replacement being these like sheets of horrible pencils and this is even crazier that each individual tooth column can have anywhere between eight to ten teeth in like a line going back into the head from embryonic teeth to ones that are in occlusion. And it has been said that this dinosaur would have replaced its teeth so frequently that it's possible. It's possible that they were replacing them every 14 days or so. Okay. That's not when you started saying that I was developing an image of my teeth of an animal that is like every time it moves its head, just more teeth (laughs) fall out. Like a cartoon piano. <laughs> yeah. Infin- like, infinite tooth <laughs> glitch. That's that's pretty cursed. Not gonna lie. That's... Well, w- what's also incredibly cursed is there are so many of these teeth and they're so densely packed together, like horizontally, that they don't even have the traditional, like, dinosaur or I guess reptile condition where they have, like, the alveolus with the tooth coming out and then a margin and then the other one and stuff uh in the paper that i was reading before this the um i'll name drop it um uh, structure and evolution of sauropod tooth uh, of a sauropod tooth battery by um uh jeff wilson and uh paul serino Mm -hmm. they literally refer to them as tooth troughs (laughs) Oh, are they? That's a bad word. Ye- they're kind they're of. They're what? Are they blurred on? Where the tooth sit in a groove as opposed I to guess sockets? Ki- 
yes, but no, I guess. Okay. Well, that's not really an answer to that question I asked, but no, it isn't. Cool. But it seems like they've kind of merged the sockets into one long socket. I yeah. don't like that. I don't like that at all. Yeah, they call it the. Um, oh, actually, the the direct phrase from this paper is, and I quote. The gaping alveolar trough that ho- that housed hundreds of slender teeth packed together as a tooth battery. That's the title of the video, by it's the way. It's got a gaper? Ga- gaping <laughs> alveolar trough. I would prefer that none of you say these things. <laughs> Desperately. Uh. <laughs> Upsetty spaghetti. And it's also... This is a cursed creature. It's worth noting that this, like... I fully buy, given the shape of this animal, that it's like a low to the ground browser of plants and that this tooth condition and that this eating evolved before grasses evolved. So it's just doing this to eat plants that other animals have been eating in a normal way for millions (laughs) of years. Like horsetails and stuff. And ferns. It's just like, it's like Elon Musk changing the design of Twitter. Yeah. Like, there is a business plan that works pretty well. Let's figure out a new one. Yeah, like, so it's also, I think it it bears being said that, like, the reason why uh, a lot of these Ornithiskians develop, develop their tooth batteries is for incredibly efficient processing of plants. Um, like g- grinding them up, what he's chewing doing. them, which no, is he's... demonstrably not what he's doing. He's basically, essentially, what he's done here is taken his teeth and w- went like, "What if I made a beak, but out of teeth?" Right. Hey, it's purely for cropping. So there's there's other things that's really weird about. Nijersaurus's head that aren't just the teeth, although the teeth are incredibly weird. Um, the head is, or the skull is so, so strange. Um, in that, like, it is very, very, very weirdly built. There's a lot of very strange, like, struts and straps that are going all over the place that sometimes are incredibly thin with some. Uh, some bones having minimum uh, thicknesses of like a millimeter, maybe two, where it is said in some of the literature that a strong light can shine through them. And this is the fossil, not even the bone. So this is permineralized. Uh, But yet again, they were still able to like take the strains of doing a lot of this like very specialized cropping and stuff, which is just weird. It's it's very strange. What a weird lawnmower of an animal. It's a very weird guy. Yes. I don't really know what to make of it. See, one of the things that I find even weirder about this is that this is one of those animals that I would be like not that surprised if we've only found one of. If it was just like Nisrosaurus was the thing that happened for a little bit, like uh, in like a hundred and five million years ago, and it was around for a touch and then it went away. But there's a chance that there's more. Uh, there have been some incredibly similar looking Nisrosaurus esque teeth that have been found on both the Island of White and in Brazil. Hmm. I hate knowing that a lot. <laughs> so there's a chance that there's at least two more out there. There and is another. Given, and given that there's one in Brazil, there might be a whole lot more out there. Uh, Global distribution of lawnmower-headed sauropods. Uh, just like... I, you know what? I, I do like. Do you? I do. I'm trying to be positive. That's good. Well, I could say another positive thing about this guy. Um, I think it's the only sauropod in the game to get the back feet correct. 
I know you picked one that's laying down, Dalton, but... I'll walk over here. I'm also... I'm in first person to show that there's little guys. Well, they're actually... This is another thing. They're they're too big. They're actually way too big. Um, way. Wait, Dalton Soros. just said they're little guys. They are little guys, but they're also... Like, the in-game model is too large. Like, this should be smaller than a Margosaurus. Hmm. Oh, I like the yeah, the foot is really good. Yeah, the back foot has has the characteristic sauropod thing of like not just it only has three visible claws, but they're like curved facing outwards. Like they did it. Congratulations. They can actually make a proper sauropod back foot. Don't look at the front feet. The front feet are bad and they did it wrong. But hey, halfway's good. We're halfway there. Um living on a prayer. I don't think have we talked about the size? I, I was Word. literally just talking about it. That um, this guy is when when we say small, we mean like small, small. So like a lot of sauropods could get, as you know, huge, Titanic, Wait, you, uh, if you will. Only a little bit. Big? Are you big? Are you doing that James Napoli always there with the joke. So I've seen that this in-game model is roughly about like 14 meters long um in life Nizersaurus would probably have been closer to nine wow so hmm. like that's pretty big and that's a pretty that's pretty big it's pretty big but it's also its size estimates put it at almost like it, like almost exactly like like every popular thing I'm seeing about this and also in, in the papers describe it as basically African elephant sized, which again, the largest living land animal, demonstrably right, a saying. very, very large animal, but one of the smallest sauropods. Yeah, that's Ooh. crazy. Yeah, so like it this this in game right? model is about is about two thirds the uh, like two uh, another third bigger than it should be. It does make you wonder if there are multiple instances of body size gain in sauropods, or if this is I mean, small because it's plesiomorphic. Hmm. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, like, right? Is this like an ancestral diplodocoid size? Well, so I mean, there are definitely multiple gains of giant size. Yeah, like. Any way you cut it, like Barap Barapasaurus like is, is a pretty early diverging um, sauropod, but it's huge. Um, and yeah, like Dalton said, Mamankisaurus too. There are right. some proposed very large Rebecca. Well, I mean, well, there's, <laughs> there's Amphicelius. A, yeah, Do we talk about it? Humongous Rebeccasaur. We we've talked about it before a little bit. Um, I think this is not a, I mean, just maybe remind our audience. This is a yeah. Good, um, which is that if you're familiar audience with the um, proposed enormous species of Amphicelus um, that was known from a single vertebra that was destroyed and so now we just have a drawing of it a good drawing but a drawing nevertheless um, which would have been like say a what you will about cope say a lot of yeah. things about cope <laughs> please write in the comments things that you would say about cope but one thing you can't Don't. say is that he was a bad drawer well, at least of bones. I've seen that one like reconstruction of the seaway he did that was pretty, pretty rough. I haven't seen that. Um, he's got some cute little d dinosaurs in it. Um, but uh, anyway, Cope drew this thing. It was destroyed. It's apparently a ver like a single vertebra that's like six feet tall. Um, and it was for a long time referred to the the, the genus Amphicelus, which would have been like a diplodocoid, um, diplodocid, and so that would have mm -hmm. been like a a tremendous, like, 200-foot-long behemoth. Um, recent studies, a, a recent study, I should say, re put it into a new genus, Marapunisaurus, and proposed that Marapunisaurus, if it's legitimate, which we don't have tremendous reason to suspect it's not legitimate, even though it is kind of sus, um, but that it was probably a Rebeccasaur. And so it would have been an enormous Rebeccasaur, but that also puts it into, like, the size class of some of the larger, like, of other large sauropods and not beyond like titanosaur size. Right. Although it is cool to have a pretty big Rebecca sore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are many worse things on the planet earth. 
Well, if it looked like this, there may be not <laughs> that many worse things on the planet Earth than a really big one of these. That's a good point. Friends, we're, bu- we're mu- bullying this guy a lot, but I like him. Yeah, it's cute. So, Nijasaurus, Amelia's not here, so I can rank it first. Well, we could say what Amelia says. Oh, yeah, Amelia we, we said something. Yes. We? Yeah, yeah. Amelia we, said, we, say, we, we are all spe- Amelia. Specifically, we are Amelia. Amelia, reporting live from the zoo, said, It looks like a bee stung him, so I'm giving him a B for Benadryl. That doesn't make much sense at all, but okay. Take a- He's got a big pudgy face. It's it's like, have you ever seen those like pictures of like a dog that tried to eat a bee and its face just like swelled up and stuff? It kind of does look yeah. like that. I, okay, I accept. I think that this creature looks terrible. I hate the way it looks. Okay. I hate that it looks inflamed. This looks like the average, like, this is the European idea of what an American looks like. <laughs> but what actually about 80% of the male population of England looks like. Right, right, exactly. We learned it by watching them. <laughs> it, it, it is. I, I don't like its, its lumbering gait. I don't like its stooped and haggard appearance. No matter what paint job you put on this animal... Um, You're just polishing a turd, as they say. This sounds like a lot of self-hate, James. Um, I don't like him one bit. We have cut many, many overly mean bits that I've made about this thing. The only one I'm comfortable keeping is that I think this looks like the average European's idea of what an American looks like. (laughs) Um, Alex laughed again because that one was funny. I don't like him. Hamburger. <laughs> I would say I would say C tier, but but the feet are accurate. They're more accurate, half accurate. I'll give them a little bit of credit. Here's the credit I'll give them: it's pretty accurate to the animal as actually known from the fossil record, with the exception being its size. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not going to give it C tier. I'm going to rank this a low B because okay. I I like that. I don't like what Niger Source looks like, but I don't like what it actually looks like. I don't dislike it because they made it look bad in the game. B tier. I'm going to basically agree with most of the things that James said. It is dopey. It is pudgy. It is haggard. It is lumbering. It, it is, is stooped. Is stooped. Yes. Um, it's it's very hippo esque. Um. Mm. And yeah, it has it has a very it has a lot of very weird and off putting features about it that when you add them up all together, make me love this thing. I I think it is fabulous. I love it so much. Um, I really enjoy putting it in my parks. Uh, I, I like this specific color pattern a lot because it draws the eye right to Right to the moneymaker, right to that weird, square, dopey face. Mm. And that's what you should be spending your most time looking at on this beautiful, goofy, put together incorrectly animal. I love him. He's getting an A. I I would have given him an S if he was smaller. I like that energy and I like your attitude. Now I am going to say I, I'm. This is I'm just going to come out and say it. I think this is a high B for me. Um, I do kind of see what James is saying in that. Uh, looking at it makes me think of season six Tony Soprano, where you're like, mm. some something's not right. There's a tragedy on the horizon, but it's it's a nice sort of. <laughs> It's it's just that like I, I I think just the aesthetics of the animal itself are not like it's not an animal I adore looking at, but it is a good yeah. Mm, mm, I do I'm looking at the back feet and I'm enjoying the back feet. This is I'm gonna say a high B. I want I want it to be known as a high B. I don't know if I would make it a low A, but I want. Do it you want to wanna know what else we have in B tier? Yeah, actually, that would be a huge help. So in B tier, we have 
Nothosaurus, Marodactylus, Triceratops, uh, Monolophosaurus, and the JP3 Pteranodon. Okay, and what are the lower three A's we currently have? Uh, I don't think we have them ranked necessarily in A. <laughs> uh, A's, we have, um, I guess, Tropignathus, we have Margosaurus. Um, Stego, uh, the Jurassic Park Velociraptor, Pyroraptor. I'm going to say this is, in fact, a low A. I'm... I like it more than the things that I have in B. Let it be said, I have changed my mind to a low A. Dalton Meyer. I'm, I'm glad you listed those, because I think I like this more than a Margosaurus. They're both, they both fall into the chumby baby category for me. And <laughs> chumby baby. I don't generally like when people make dinosaurs chumby babies. It works for a Margosaurus, and it works even a little better for this one. I like watching, especially watching just its body. This is maybe one of the more pleasantly like made sauropods in the game. Especially, like the back feet are doing a lot of work, but just watching its body like walk, I I dig it. Um, there's a peacefulness, there's a serenity to this, um, to the stooping. I I am a little. I think they've packed on a little too much chumby, maybe, um, especially the head is is quite. Uh, soft tissue full uh, perhaps to its detriment a little bit but I don't have any real major complaints about this um, I think yeah I wish more of the color patterns had the, the facial thing than just this kind of yellowish white one um, but I like this a lot and I think I do tend to try to put it in my parks whenever I'm not doing a weird theme um, mm-hmm I like it. I'm not so bothered by the size thing because generally when I play the game, I'm not inspecting that so closely. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it crosses the threshold to S for me. It doesn't like amaze me, but I like it a lot. I'm, I'm going to put it in A tier. All right. Fair. Well, we've got two uh, negative Bs and we've got two uh, positive As. So I think this three one positive is A's. A pos- three positive As. A positive <laughs> I or also I guess a I just, negative in this case because it would be low A for average. I I just had I just had the thought that, um, and this just idly crossed my mind. I bet that if this thing could speak English, it would sound like Nixon. <laughs> I think it would sound that impression like droopy dog. No, it's it's it's. <laughs> oh, it might. Yeah, it's second term Ronald Reagan. <laughs> this gives Eeyore a lot. I'm yeah, sorry. This it does this, give Eeyore. And with I'll that. Spiggle. Spin this. I well, spin this. Not yet. And with that, we first have to put Nichersaurus in A tier. Hooray. Wow. Now that we have put Nichersaurus in its place, it is time oh, yeah. to spin. 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 That. 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 Wheel. 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 Round and round and round she goes. Where will it land? Nobody knows. No. 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 Oh, no. 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 oh yeah. Yes. All right. Well, we can't do this one tonight because it's no, going to be a three hour video. We cannot. We cannot. We cannot. Well, I, guys. I have nothing nice to say about this. It, the worst design in the entire Jurassic franchise? That'll be the caption. Well, no, no. it's not the worst. It's not even worse in the game. It's also a f-ing great design, so you guys are stupids. No. Oh, the colors. The movie design. The movie design is design is good. The game one's terrible. No, the game one. The game one does not do the movie as much justice, but it's fine. It's well. We shouldn't spoil it tomorrow's episode of Prime. <laughs> oh, that's right. We're still returning. Tomorrow's Next episode. Next week's episode. Next week's episode. I am so to... tired. We are putting these episodes out daily now. Come back every <laughs> single day for a new Jurassic World ranking, everybody. Dear, <laughs> dear viewers. Dear viewers. Let it... Let it... If you send money to our Patreon, we will buy James Napoli water bottles. <laughs> so his brain doesn't fall apart like it currently is. We'll buy him water bottles and caffeine pills. 
Listen, and parts of his. Do you know? Do you know how trying off. it is on a man? Do you know how difficult it is to wake up, roll out of bed at top speed, drive to the lab, work in the lab all day on a paper that needs to come out quite urgently, get paper done, drink coffee, drive home, eat dinner, like shoveling food into your mouth before starting to record, and not drinking water at any point in the entire day. Did you finish the paper today? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. It's, it's almost started, Dalton. Nice. Okay. No, uh, that's I, that's I didn't mean it sarcastically. That makes much more sense. I was scared for you when you said papers done. I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's like that scene in SpongeBob where he just like where he's trying to write the essay and he l- l- drops the pencil. It, it falls out of his hand and it's literally smoking. Yeah. Well, anyway. Okay, guys, so that's it for this episode. Um, If you like this video, we'd like to do the YouTuber thing and, you know, remind you that you should like the video, leave a comment on the video, um, and subscribe to the Skeleton Crew if you haven't already. And if you can, consider joining the Skeleton Crew Patreon. The Skeleton Crew Patreon is a wonderful place, and good things happen in our patron-only Discord. You will get many benefits as a member of the Skeleton Crew Patreon. One of those benefits is that if you are a patron, your name will be scrolling right now on screen. And if you're a very, very special patron, I will say your name right now, speaking you into being. We use thought form here. This is the Aragon series or something like that. I have never read those books. That's not at all (laughs) what the magic system in that book is. Um, It's a pretty good magic system. I'm going to very... I'm going to very boldly and confidently say something about a book series I've never read and just spitball to see if it's right. <laughs> what? Hang on. Yeah. They, they can think magic, though, can't they? Or is it just spoken? I don't now. I don't remember. No, I thought it was that. I, I don't mean thought form. I'm sorry. I thought it was that when like, is there something in the magic system in those books I haven't read? About like knowing something's true name. Yes, it's all about knowing the like true names of things in like the the, the magic language, which is also just happens to be Elvish. Okay, well in that case, I'll say the true names of our most special patrons. These are Benjamin Seepser, <laughs> nickname three one one zero, Philip Fico, Andrew Niddle, Christopher Bellis Jones, Dan O'Kyrus, King Zashu, Max Ironpaw, original username Pythonic. Riley Shero, Swamp Ape Science, and Wheat. That's a good name. Wheat. Wheat. We love Wheat. We uh, Swamp Ape Science is a great name, and it's good to see you up here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the support. Welcome. All right, everybody. That is it for the Skeleton Crew this week. We will talk about Dilophosaurus next week, not tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and we're going to get this tired little silly guy to bed. So that He's he can such a silly guy. Such a silly guy. We are all so tired, but we love you very much. Good night. Good night. Sleep well. Good night. Good night. Sleep well, and don't let those big bed bu- bed bugs bite. Those big bugs, because they carry worms. Speaking of Emmanuel, I saw him at the Norel conference. Oh, oh wonderful! You know, How's he doing? He's doing well. His daughter's two and a half. Our oh, sister. Our, our sister. Yes. That's a good age. And that, um, that's nice. I remembered, he, well, he, I reminded him that we used to say that he was our mother. And he was like, ah, oh, yes, I forgot about the weird things you and Scott used to say to me. <laughs> <laughs> I miss I that was, guy. I do like our interactions with normal people. Right, when they're like, why are you saying this? <laughs> <laughs>